the, um, so today we are actually focusing on uh, the asp morphological aspects uh, of intelligent behavior. So the next speaker is uh, Alexander Schmidt from the Waseda University in Japan. And he will talk about uh, soft, the, the role of soft uh, compliance in uh, someone I would say more traditionally human-robot interaction. He says very appropriately human symbiotic robots. So Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you for accepting my invitation. OK. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yes, and uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So um, today I'm going to speak about softness and compliance in human symbiotic robots. And I will also quickly show some of the robots that have been built in Waseda over the years. So OK, so in this slide, um, you see like actually the first humanoid robot ever in the, in the world was built in Waseda in 1973. And they, they tried to build like this general purpose robot and it didn't have a lot of compliance because um, it was basically the first trial ever. So, and then in 1984, they tried to build a more uh, purpose specific robot. So they built Vavo 2, which was a piano playing robot. And we will see videos of those robots later. And yes, and then in 1992, the humanoid robot uh, humanoid project started and actually there were there were a lot of humanoid robots built in Waseda and a lot of them used uh, compliance, adjustable compliance and I will also speak about those later. And then um, I will also quickly speak about the Wobble House because maybe you learned that it's very difficult for robots to interact in unstructured environments so there was this trial with the Wabot House to help robots in this case. And of course, there are many other robots in Waseda University as well. Uh, for example, surgical robots or human, um, human robot conversation robots, and recently also disaster robots. So yeah, so I already introduced those robots, so Wabot 1 and Wabot 2. And afterwards, the, the research in Waseda split up into two directions. There were the human symbiotic robots and uh, uh, legged robots. So Waseda also has a lot of interesting legged uh, robots. OK, as I already mentioned two or three times by now, I think, uh, Wabot 1 was the first full-scale humanoid robot ever. And interestingly enough, this was 10 years after the first bullet train was traveling from Tokyo to Osaka, and also after we sent the first man to the hum uh, after we sent the first man to the moon. So it seems that it's actually more difficult to build robots than to send a man to the moon, obviously, right? And yeah, so maybe we can show the video of Bob one, please. Nathan, yes. So, yes, it's, if you ever come to Waseda, you can actually see it. It's still uh, out there. And obviously, it's very hard to build a robot like this. And it was actually able to walk, and it could also grasp objects already. So it had a vision system. So now you can see the walking. So this robot obviously has no compliance, and that's partially to blame why the walking is not very good. But of course, in, 19, in the 1970s, it was also very hard to get good hardware. Like everything just started. So OK, maybe we can stop the video. OK, and then the next robot that I want to talk about was uh, Wabot 2. And so in this case, they, they focused very much on a specific task. And this was playing piano. And I think to build a robot like this would be still very challenging today. And this robot did actually also performed at the expo in, in Tokyo. And 
It also played in front of the prince, which is now the emperor of Japan. And so maybe we can show the video, please. This is the Waseda song, by the way. Don't you think the Wabat 2 robot gave a superb performance? It was almost human. This robot is the fruit of three and a half years of Waseda University's students' research and development. About 50 students were involved in this project, and we are now looking forward to the Wabot 3 in the near future. Actually, this robot, it was reading the notes from a uh, normal paper, so it's reading normal notes and then it's playing. So maybe we can just play 10 seconds of the, of the next video, please, to show that it can also play other songs. And I think it's a, it's a great achievement that they could build this a long time ago. <laughs> Okay, so th those were some of the very, very early robots in Waseda, and especially Wabot 2, uh, Wabot 1 had no compliance, and Wabot 2 had a little bit of compliance because of its joints, but basically not so much uh, of compliance. Okay, so going on a little bit about the history. So, um, as I said before, then the research in Waseda split up into two strands. One was the human symbiotic robots, and one was the leg robots. And yeah, and there is also other research, it's like surgical robots and uh, wheelchair and so on. Okay, then um, one more thing that I want to talk uh, before I speak about before I actually speak about compliance um, is like the Wabot House. So I'm sure, as you learned uh, during your lecture series, it's very hard for robots to interact in unstructured environments. So the goal in, in this research project was um, to, uh, to structure the environment for the robot a little bit in order to help him. So, and they developed this indoor uh, navigation system to have a seamless navigation from indoor to outdoor. And they used GPS compatible signals for the indoor navigation. And like this, it was, the robot was able to move um, indoor and outdoor. And they actually built this house in the Gifu prefecture, and here you can see a picture of this um, house with uh, the movable kitchen and the indoor navigation system and so on. But okay, so the main part of my talk is actually uh, human symbiotic robots. And so if you want to have robots that coexist with humans, obviously you have a lot of requirements, in particular uh, safety, um, then uh, physical interaction, and for this compliance is very important, and also communication. And it's also very hard to act uh, in a human environment. You, you need to use tools and so on. So we're going to see some videos for that as well. OK, um, can you play the next video, please? So. So in this video, 
uh, you see the robot and it uses uh, adjustable series elastic actuators and because of this it's very compliant and it's very safe to use and the control can be very easy so um, actually the control in this case was very very easy and yes so you, you see it's very safe and like with me, with most robots I wouldn't I wouldn't try to do this because maybe they seriously injure you but with with this uh, robot it was possible okay so let's stop the video please so um, this robot it uses um, adjustable springs actually it uh, uses mechanical impedance adjuster and um, because of this it can adjust the length of the spring it can adjust the length of the effective uh, compliant uh, element because sometimes you want to be very soft but for other tasks you need to be very hard and so in, in this case you can adjust it and they also made a, a rotary version of this so this is a, a early example of a robot that could actually adjust its compliance and so next we're gonna speak about 21 and 21 is doesn't have adjustable series elastic actuators it has uh, just series elastic actuators because basically the problem with uh, with the other system was that it's very big and maybe series elastic actuators are sufficient for a lot of tasks but 21 is a lot stronger it can lift half a human uh, the, the, the weight of half a human and it's also a lot more capable so let's see some videos about the capabilities of 21 please so next video and you will also see that the, that the human um, talks with the robot for those of you who understand it's Japanese and so the robot across the object and next we will see that the robot can be very compliant because it includes a lot of springs both in the arm and in the hands and so the human can move the object uh, that the robot is grasping okay ah yes exactly the arm so okay thank you very much so 21 uh, on the one hand um, it has like this nice series elastic actuator it uses a torsion bar in order to have a very space efficient uh, compliant actuation and then furthermore it's covered with soft skin and sensitive skin um, to, to, to be safe basically for human robot interaction and also the hands are covered with uh, soft material and they incorporate a lot of sensors in particular there are 241 distributed tactile sensors and there are small size 6 axis for storage sensors in all the fingertips and you have these flexible joints and all these uh, combined could produce the behavior that we just saw and furthermore um, also the shape of the fingertips is very important of course um, so some fingertips they're just uh, spherical or cylinders but in the case of 21 they aimed for a humans human like shape and with a shape like this um, the, the contact area depends on the on the angle and so that's useful information and also because um, the contact is soft um, you don't have point contacts but you have surface contacts and I'm, I'm sure you learned how structuring your sensor input is very important 
And so in this case, the softness of the fingertips helps in structuring the sensor inputs. Okay, so let's show the egg cooking experiment, maybe. So in this case, you will see that the robot is capable of breaking eggs, which is a very complex behavior. And so it had to use basically all these things. It had to use softness, compliance, uh, high degree of actuation, and also the soft and compliant joints and the soft cover of the skin. Okay, so because we're a little bit late, so maybe let's stop the video here. But it did it over and over again. Okay, and then in the next video, you will see that the robot is able to perform dexterous manipulation. So this is 21 now. So it, it grasps a straw. Maybe it's difficult to see in the video chat, but this is a very small object. And it's able to do this because it also has fingernails and because of the, the nice uh, shape of the fingertips. And then using all the sensors that it has, it can perform um, inhand manipulation in this case so, so that it can grasp the str a straw in a way in, in order to put it inside of the glass. And now your drink is ready. Okay, thank you very much. And another video of um, cooking assistance. So in this case, the robot is using tools and again, natural uh, language. So it grasps uh, the tweezer and uses this tool in order to grab the toast. You can see it's a little bit uh, shaky. That's because of the serious elastic actuators. And so, yes. So it can put the toast on the plate. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, and another video. Okay, so two more videos. In the next video, um, you will see that the uh, human and the robot are interact and that the robot can be compliant or stiff according to the requirements. So, so he tells the robot to go back a little bit and so he, he, he uses the, the, the soft skin and the sensors in the skin to push it back. And he tell him, okay, please help me to go into the wheelchair. And so first you see that the arm will be very soft and the human can move it in any position where he, where he sees its fit. And then afterwards he tells him, okay, please be stiff. And so he can support the weight of the human and can help him to go into the wheelchair. And if you try this with most uh, humanoid robots, they, they would just break and or it just wouldn't work. But 21 was actually very strong and compliant at the same time, which is, a ch which, which is challenging. Okay, uh, next video, please. So you see the same task with a different human, just to show you that it was not pre-programmed behavior, but so it's different voice, different human, different behavior. So again, first the robot is soft, and then afterwards he can be uh, strong and stiff if necessary. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time left, but I quickly want to show some of the recent research that we have done also. And so in this case, we used um, the tactile sensors to recognize objects. 
So the robot grasped objects and he didn't use vision, but he grasped the object a couple of times in unknown orientation and he used all the information from the tactile sensors in order to recognize the object. And we also use deep learning. Um, I hope you also learn about uh, machine learning a little bit. So in this case, he used deep learning and um, he got a recognition rate of 88% with the multimodal tactile sensing, so the 6 axis post torque sensor and the distributed sensors. So that was a very nice uh, result to get this recognition rate of 88%. And another thing that we, we recently did that was uh, Iris paper this year was inhand manipulation. So we show a couple of examples. Um, we use a data glove to show a couple of examples of inhand manipulation behavior that we want. And then the robot could, then we used machine learning again, also deep learning, and then the robot could perform the behavior for unknown sizes and unknown shapes, shapes and sizes that he has, had never seen before. So if you want to know more about this, please have a look at the IRIS uh, 2013 paper. And then finally, I want to speak a little bit about um, some new hardware that we are currently building. And so we, we, are cur we currently have this um, project, Soft Actuation for Industry. And so I'm sure that you learned that currently most industrial robots, they are stiff. And that's, of course, that's problematic for both safety and um, also that's, that's uh, just not, not very nice for a lot of things. And actually, currently, a lot of the major um, robot manufacturers, they, they realize the need for robots that work together with humans and humans and robots uh, share the workspace. And what they usually do is they include torque sensors into the joints and they achieve compliance actively by torque control. But this means that there is no intrinsic safety and there is always the time delay uh, due to the control. And so that's also not so nice. And what, what is happening a lot in research is um, that intrinsic safety can be achieved with springs. So maybe you learned about the serious elastic actuators. And that's used a lot in research, but it's rarely used in industry because it has compromised position control. And for industry, some, it's important that you have um, fast motions and precise motions. So what we want in this project is we want precise, fast, and safe motion at the same time. And so we developed this new actuator, which has controllable impedance. It's completely back drivable and has separated force and position control. And so maybe we can play the next video, please. So normal robots are stiff, most of them but we can achieve very, very compliant behavior. And in this case, there is no control. It's, this is completely passive behavior. And we can easily adjust, the res uh, easily adjust the resistance. And because of this, the robot can be also very safe. So in the next video, please, um, you will see that the robot is uh, hitting a cup but it's not hurting the cup. And also in this case, there was no control. It was just um, the passive um, impedance that we set. And another thing um, that would be important is a soft cover is also in, uh, crucial against impact forces. And if, if you have uh, sensitive skin, that would add another layer of safety and it can be used also for our, um, Tactile object recognition, for example, like we were, like we saw before, and currently most of the sensors they're too big and they measure only the normal forces. So we develop tactile sensors that are soft. They provide three axis measurements. They're physically small. Uh, they have digital output, and they're easy to produce. So they also need very little wires. So they're very easy to implement on the robot. And yeah, very soon we will put them on the, on the robot. And that actually brings me to the end of my talk, so thank you very much for listening.
Okay, I don't know if you have a big question. We have time for a quick question. And a question from Plymouth? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. That was great. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could go a little bit more into details on the last uh, industrial manipulator you showed. And how, how do you actually achieve the, the kind of variable passive compliance or variable impedance in that arm? Okay, yes. I, am, I, I, I thought that I would get this question, but unfortunately I cannot tell it at the moment because we actually have a big, um, we want to make it into a product and we got a big research fund for this and we also applied for the patent, so, so uh, for the moment I cannot uh, disclose details, I'm sorry. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you uh, for your um, cool talk. And now, and now